It's 1988 and America is nuts for Nintendo. Home video gaming is growing in popularity. In the United States, Nintendo is king. Ahead of Christmas, ABC's 2020 sends reporter John Stossel to look into what this Nintendo thing is all about. He stands in line with parents hoping to land a console and games for the Christmas holiday. I have to live with my kids for the rest of the year, so I have to have this one. The hottest games of the season? Mario 2 and The Adventure of Link. Stossel reported on a shortage of the games at stores. He came a thousand miles just for this game? Yeah. I've done seven stores a day for three weeks now. I cannot find it. Nintendo reps told him it was a combination of demand exceeding their expectations and a chip shortage keeping games off shelves. Despite that shortage, Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link would go on to become the eighth best-selling game on the NES. It sold more than four million copies. That's according to Wikipedia citing themagicbox.com. Fast forward to today and Zelda 2 is looked at as a curiosity, an aberration in the series. It's commonly referred to as the black sheep of the Zelda family. That's largely because the adventure of Link doesn't play like the original game. While the original game was primarily played and viewed from a top-down overhead perspective, this game is primarily played and viewed from a side-on, two-dimensional view. The top-down view is here too, but it's more limited, seen only when players are traveling from one location to another, and it's constantly interrupted by side-scrolling action scenes. Why is Zelda 2 so different? Well, that's the focus of this week's episode of Legendary Adventures Podcast. I'm Paul Riley, and we're kicking off Season 2 with a brief discussion of the history of Zelda 2, a look at how it came about, before diving in and playing the game for this season. Full disclosure up front, I would say this is my least favorite game in the series. I've never played it to completion prior to recording this podcast. In fact, I made a decision to write and record this podcast well in advance of releasing episodes, in part because of my hesitation with this game. I tried to play through it multiple times, but I never reached the end. While there are some elements to enjoy, the high difficulty level and the leveling system generally led me to quit around the time I reached Death Mountain. That's why I played through the special edition on the Nintendo Switch NES Online service. That version starts the player with what could be considered the second quest of Zelda 2, or what we in modern terms might refer to as a New Game Plus mode. The player starts the game at maximum level 8 for attack, life, and magic. Players also begin with all magic spells already collected and all of Link's sword abilities. This allows returning players to skip the game's smaller quests which are required to get those spells and sword abilities and go straight to the dungeons. I want the decreased difficulty that this mode offers, but I also want to take on those pre-dungeon quests in order to experience this game the way it was intended to unfold. Each quest, however, will end with an old man or a swordsman that grants the spell or the ability simply saying that they cannot help Link. I'll still go through all the steps to get to that person, and I also not use any magic until I reach the person who grants it. Now let's rewind back to the beginning to answer the question of why the adventure of Link is so different from its predecessor. In short, it's because series co-creators Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka largely handed Zelda 2 over to an entirely new team. In an interview with Superplay magazine, Miyamoto said, It was my idea, but the actual game was developed by another team, different people to those who made the first game. Miyamoto remains a producer on the project. Tezuka was reportedly a writer on Zelda 2. Wikipedia cites a German-language club Nintendo issue for that fact. I don't speak or read German, so I'm unable to confirm what the article says. The game's staff credits are also listed as a source on Wikipedia, but watching the end credits, I don't see Tezuka listed. He was generally credited under the pseudonym Tenten at the time, and that name does not appear. The Adventure of Link was co-directed by Tadashi Sugiyama, and Yasuhisa Yamamura. In a 2016 interview published on Nintendo's Japanese website, Sugiyama discussed how development of the game began. He said, It all started with Mr. Miyamoto saying, I want to make a side-scrolling action game where you can use up and down attacks and defenses. Sugiyama further states the concept was not initially intended to be a Zelda game. He stated, I was experimenting with how different swords and shields would feel, so I wasn't really conscious of the first game system. Eventually, the decision was made to make a sequel to Zelda. Sugiyama describes the development process as being a long one for the time, with about 10 people working on the game. Sugiyama's experimentation led to a game where the attacks and defenses happen on two planes, high and low, 
Players switch between the two by standing or ducking. Fights are frequent and can be difficult. When encountering humanoid enemies, especially the iron knuckle enemies, the sword fighting game concept is most clear, as players stand, duck, jump, and stab to get around the enemy's defenses. Players also have to be conscious of enemy attacks and whether they are high or low so they can shield appropriately. Zelda 2 leans harder into some RPG tropes compared to the first game, while simultaneously moving away from others. The overworld is an example of it leaning in. It's similar to RPG titles like Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy, where towns, caves, and dungeons, other locations are more or less represented by icons on the map screen. While exploring the overworld, enemy and fairy icons also appear and they move erratically around the screen. If a player touches one of them, the game will transition to a 2D action screen. The enemy icons are difficult to dodge, and while they're not completely random, they do have the feel of random battles in RPG titles like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. Sugiyama's memory about why this mechanic was adopted was fuzzy, but he said the field map was narrowed, so I think the method was adopted so that the element of luck would appear. The game is also unique among the Zelda series for containing a system of experience points and leveling. It works similar to systems seen in RPGs and many modern action and adventure games that have blended that RPG element into their gameplay. Players gain experience from defeating monsters and after reaching a set amount they gain a level. Players can then apply that level to one of three attributes, attack, magic, or life. As previously mentioned, these attributes each max out at level 8. Players can gain enough experience to level up by defeating Alvinis on the overworld and in dungeons, but they also gain the exact amount of experience they need to gain one level by completing a dungeon. Of this system, Sugiyama said, There were various restrictions at the time, so I think we added an element that allows you to level up so that you can fight enemies as many times as you like. While in some ways Zelda 2 leans more into RPG mechanics than the original game, it backs away from others. For example, there's no economy in this game. There's no collectible currency, nothing to spend it on, health and magic restorations are given away for free in town. All tools to complete the game's quest are found in caves or dungeons, and none are available for sale as we saw in the first game. This game also does away with all the equipment upgrades seen in the first game. Players will start and end the game with the exact same sword, there are no upgrades. Leveling up Link's attack will make him hit harder, but there's no way to further boost the effect by equipping a different sword. There are also no rings to increase Link's defense power. Instead, players level up Link's life stat to reduce the amount of damage he takes from enemies. Hidden heart containers can be found to expand Link's life meter. There is no magic book this time around to boost Link's magic power. Instead, players must level up that magic stat to reduce the cost of magic. Magic jars are also hidden around the world which expand Link's magic meter. Zelda 2 is notoriously difficult. The combat challenges are tough. The way forward is at times obscure, and on top of it all, the game leans hard into an arcade game trope. It grants Link only three lives. Once those lives are lost, players receive a game over, their experience points are reset, and they are sent back to the starting of the game. There are six Link dolls hidden throughout the game. These are like one-ups found in Super Mario. They increase Link's life count by one. However, once that extra life is lost, it can never be gained again. The Link dolls do not regenerate. Sugiyama admits that the high difficulty level was intended to pad out the playtime, but he also attributes some of it to the testing and development process. He said, I wanted to keep players playing for as long as possible, so it felt like it wasn't easy to clear. Perhaps because we were doing everything ourselves, including the debugging work, we played the game so much that we ended up with a higher level of difficulty that we found interesting. For his part, though, Sugiyama seems to understand the difficulty was too high for many players. He shared this story. I received a phone call from a customer who said, I can't beat the final boss. When I listened to his story carefully, he had already reached the state of full equipment. That means that there was no other way to clear it than with your own skill. So it was very difficult to answer. It seemed that person was playing for his child. I'm sorry, he said. With the change in team members, there also came a change in composer for the game. The music for Zelda 2 was composed by Akito Nakasuka. He largely did away with the music from the original game, though there are a few references to the original. The main example is found in the overworld theme for both games. Here's the original game's overworld music.
And here's the theme for Zelda 2. But on the whole, this is an entirely new soundtrack. The music for this game has not embedded itself into the larger popular culture the way the music for the original game did. And among gaming enthusiasts, the soundtrack's biggest claim to fame is the inclusion of the dungeon theme in the Super Smash Bros. soundtrack. Within the Zelda series, there are a few tunes from this game that do live on and get regular use to this day. For example, the Level Up theme. Take a listen to it here in Zelda 2. And now here it is in Majora's Mask. And here it is in Breath of the Wild. That's just a few examples of that theme being used throughout the series. There are other pieces of music that occasionally appear in other games as well. For example, the fairy theme. Here it is in Zelda 2. And here it is from Triforce Heroes. <laughs> Zelda 2 does a lot to expand the storytelling of the series. It's much more complex than the original game. Again, most of it is told in the manual, and again, it's poorly summarized on the attract screen. But there are also small storytelling elements spread throughout the game through the inclusion of towns and quests. Here's a quick summary of the story that's told in the manual. In the distant past, a king of Hyrule hid the Triforce of Courage away, knowing that his son and heir would not be responsible enough to wield all three pieces of the magical artifact when he was king. The king's daughter, Princess Zelda, knew the location of the hidden Triforce and how to obtain it. Her brother, seeking that information, teamed up with an evil wizard and threatened her. When she refused to tell them the secret of the Triforce, the wizard cast a spell on her, putting her into a magic sleep. The wizard then died. The brother regretted his action and declared all future princesses of Hyrule will be named Zelda. Generations later, after defeating Ganon in the first game, Link continues to serve the Princess Zelda of his time. When he turns 16, a symbol of three triangles appears on his hand. Impa explains that this means that Link is destined to find the Triforce of Courage and waken the ancient sleeping Princess Zelda. To do so, Link must travel to six palaces and place a crystal within a statue. That will allow him to enter a seventh palace to receive the Triforce. As Link sets off on his adventure, monstrous forces still loyal to Ganon seek to kill Link so that they can use his blood in a ceremony to revive their master. Again, players will find this story expounded upon as they play the game, with characters and towns offering hints about dungeons and providing additional quests and warnings. It's not a lot, especially by today's standards, and I suspect some modern players would suggest that this game has no story compared to more recent games, but it's clear that there is an increased story element in this game, and the story elements will only expand further as the series continues. Zelda 2 was well received at the time of its release. Again, it sold more than 4 million copies, on top of receiving generally positive reviews at the time. But in the years since, it has become known as the black sheep of the Zelda family. Shigeru Miyamoto singled out Zelda 2 as a game he's disappointed in multiple times. In the Superplay Magazine interview from 2003, he refers to the game as sort of a failure. In 2013, in an interview with Kotaku, Miyamoto said, I think we could have done more with Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. When designing games, we have our plan for what we're going to design, but in the process it evolves and grows from there. In Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, unfortunately we ended up creating what we originally had planned on paper. He further stated that he felt, in the case of Zelda 2, we had a challenge just in terms of what the hardware was capable of doing. That feeling of wanting to do something more could perhaps explain the enduring legacy of Zelda 2. The game's story and world will continue to influence future games. Gameplay elements introduced here will also live on, such as the magic meter, and the combat even lives on in a way, as the developers famously had it in mind while designing Ocarina of Time. We'll delve more into that when we get there in this series. For now, we're going to dive into Zelda II The Adventure of Link. We're going to play through each dungeon, and then wrap it all up with a look at the game's world as a whole. If you want to follow along, please consider subscribing. Please also consider sharing this podcast with another Zelda fan. Next week, we're heading to the first palace in the game, Parappa Palace. Zelda 2 can be played on Nintendo Switch NES Online with a subscription. 
In addition to sounds from Zelda 2, this episode features a vintage electro pop loop by Frankum. It's licensed under Creative Commons 4.0 with attribution. A link to that loop can be found in the description. I'm Paul Riley. Thanks for listening. Thank you.